I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll uh, start here, I guess probably now, since I just interrupted you, you all. Um, so my name is Tycho Anderson. I'm here with uh, James Page. Um, I'm uh, on the LexD development team. I've worked for Canonical for about two and a half years, and about two, uh, two of those years I've focused on uh, working containers, mostly in user space, although more recently in the kernel. Hi, so I'm James Page. Um, I'm technical architect of the OpenStack team at uh, Canonical. I've been with Canonical about five years, uh, most of which I've been working on OpenStack. Um, and uh, I'm a Debian developer, Ubuntu core developer, and OpenStack contributor. So my team's responsible for all the packaging, um, charms, and QA around OpenStack that we do for on Ubuntu. And so today uh, we want to talk a little bit more about uh, something Mark me mentioned, which is uh, LexD, the peer container hypervisor, and in particular, uh, what sort of benefits it offers you if you use it uh, as a part of OpenStack. Um, so one number uh, Mark mentioned was the 14x density. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about other numbers later. But uh, first, I'd like to give you just a little introduction to LexD itself. Um, LexD uh, is, you can, th the, the, one of the core tenets in is that it's very simple. You can use it as a building block for uh, any project that you're involved in. Um, it's, the way to think of it is, is a, as a, an API for containers. It has uh, lots of things like uh, secure by default and other, and other things. Um, but the, the, the core of LexD is really the API itself. And so the, it offers a, a very simple way to access and, and create and destroy and, and do all the, the hypervisor-like operations you'd like to do with containers um, as, a, as a very nice and designed experience. So the, this, this API was not grown organically, um, but, the, but the, the command line and the API as well were both designed um, so that it, it's nice and easy to use. Um, the second thing is uh, that LexD is fast. Um, and James is going to talk a little bit more about some benchmarks that we uh, have prepared for this summit to just give you a little idea of how fast it is. Uh, so I don't want to steal all of his thunder, so I'll just leave it at that um, to say that LexD is very fast. And finally, LexD is secure. Um, so we, we use all of the available kernel security primitives today um, in order to, to make sure that uh, your containers are isolated from each other and that uh, they can't attack the host or do anything um, nefarious. And so the, uh, the, the, the point here that I want to make is just that, that we use everything that, that uh, the upstream community knows how to do today to make containers secure in order to make them secure. Um, I, the last thing that I'd like to do is, is kind of position LexD. When people think of um, containers, they typically think of uh, application containers like Rocket or uh, Docker. And, and we at Ubuntu really enjoy using these tools. Um, the, the innovations they bring, in particular around image management, are really fantastic. Um, but there's also uh, another set of things here, the, the more traditional hypervisors that you, you think of, um, you know, VMware, Hyper-V, uh, those sorts of things, which do the full hardware virtualization. And, and kind of where LexD fits in is, is with these down here. Although it's, um, it's not a full hardware virtualization, and in particular, that's what gives it all of the advantages, the performance advantages that it has, um, it, it looks, the API looks and feels, the, the tool set that you have looks and feels like uh, a hypervisor. And that enables you to do hypervisory things. So you can do things like take snapshots, you can do things like live migration and other uh, things that you expect to be able to do with a hypervisor. This is a traditional uh, virtual machine experience. The thing looks like a machine. I think James in his demo later is going to log in and you know, look at the syslog and other things. All of these things that you expect to be able to do with a machine. So your users are not confused. They perhaps don't even know that they're using containers, but here you are getting all of the performance benefits that we're going to tell you about. And with that. Thanks, thanks, thanks Tycho. So uh, we're now going to take a look about how we've used LexD in the context of OpenStack. So this is LexD as a hypervisor for OpenStack. So first things first, this is a complementing technology. We, we're, we're not saying you have to run your entire cloud on LexD-based containers. This should be part of your cloud story in a, in a hybrid cloud. So alongside KVM, VMware, and Hyper-V, LexD provides an alternative way to provide machine resources to as part of your cloud story. 
Um, and, and Lexd fits in to OpenStack just like uh, libvirt and KVM does in an OpenStack deployment. So what does that look like? Well, it looks just like using the, no the Nova API or, or Horizon, which we'll look at in a minute as well. So you've got all the standard operations, boot, reboot, stop, delete. You can associate floating IPs. You can make snapshots. You can do resize operations. You can do uh, migration operations. So these containers, when they're de Lexd containers, when they're part of an OpenStack deployment, feel just like a KVM instance from an end user perspective. It should be a familiar experience. And as a result, all the tooling you already have that works with your KVM virtual machines should also work with a LexD container as part of an OpenStack cloud. We also are able to manage resources. So uh, in the same way as when you uh, boot a particular flavor under KVM, you get a fixed number of uh, CPUs and, and memory and, and disk resources. You get exactly the same in LexD. So we can constrain the containers to ensure that they, ha they have the resources of the flavor that they've been booted as. And that's exposed directly down into the container. So the container itself, when the process is running and it's running, they can tell they've got uh, you know, 2 gig and a, a core, or eight, 16 gig and eight, um, 8 cores to actually consume, so they can configure themselves appropriately. And we'll, we'll take a little bit of a look of exactly how that works in a bit in the demo. We can also migrate containers. Uh, Taiko touched on this, on this before. So we can, we can shift our workloads around. So if, if we do feel that a, a container needs moving off a very highly contended host, it is possible to then migrate that off to, to something that's a little less busy. And you know, that, that allows us to, to have the, the migration features that you typically find uh, in a KVM-based cloud, but also in a LexD-based cloud as well. So we can move those workloads around if need be. So let's dive into that demo, uh, see how this goes. OK. so. Um, we've got a, a LexD OpenStack cloud uh, deployed. Um, it's the one that we did our, our benchmarking on, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's just a, a small four-node cloud. Um, and you can see, let me just dive in here. And it's now going to want me to log in. I logged in too early. Apologies. OK, so we can see we've got three LexD-based hypervisors in this cloud. Um, they've all got 24 cores, so re relatively um, reasonable performance machines. Um, we have deployed a workload onto this cloud, um, and we've done that using um, Juju, our, our, our service modeling tool. So we've used the, the OpenStack provider for Juju, and we've deployed one of our reference big data bundles, which includes Hadoop, um, Spark, and Zeppelin, onto that cloud in, in machine containers. Um, and if we drill into this a little bit, we can see that we have um, multiple services all related together, all running on um, individual machine containers, which we'll dig into in a little bit. So if we, we pop back to our Horizon dashboard, we can see all of those same services. We can see the instances that are actually running them as well. So these are the, the actual machines. And you can see their specifications as well. Um, that, are, that are running that service. Um, so let's hop on to the terminal and take a look at that as well. So so this is the, the Juju command line. Um, it, it shows you exactly the same information as the GUI, but obviously in a, a command line consumable format. So we can see here that we've got um, multiple um, uh, compute node, compute slaves in our, our big data deployment. Uh, they're all ready to go. You can see that they've all been deployed and they're booted and, and ready to start running workloads. You can see all the machines that, that are supporting that. Um, and again, we can. Sorry, I lost my focus. I've got a little bit of lag here. This, this cloud is on the Isle of Man, so it's a fair way <coughs> geographically from here. Let's. Uh, we can, we can see all the, the, the Nova uh, instances running, and we can do the kind of operations you'd be, expect to be able to do on those things. So so we can pull the console log. We can see the, the log from when the machine booted. We can, we can do all the, the standard operations. 
And we can also log into these machines. So just to, to demonstrate that this feels like a full machine container, um, we can see uh, this is a four gig machine. Um, you can see that it's got um, its own process stack. We can see the processes that are running for this machine container. It has in it, it has syslog, it has cron, it has all the features you'd expect from a full system. Um, and if we just prove the process a bit as well. Uh, this got a couple of calls, this, this machine. So we're, we're able to restrict those resources um, to allow the container to run in a very specific configuration. OK, and I'll, I'll just to prove that is all functional, I'll also just run a, a quick um, reference on there. So th this, this deployment is running Spark. Um, so we're just running the, the Spark Pi uh, sample application, which, which uses the, the big data cluster to very quickly, to not a very large number of figures, crunch the, the value of Pi. Um, it does that in a, in a random way by looking at circles and throwing darts and stuff I don't particularly understand. Um, but anyway, there's calculated pi. It's used the resources in the cluster underneath, and it's given us a result back. So um, that's the end of my demo. So um, if you get, anybody wants to try this, the, we've got a bundle up on the Juju Time Store. Uh, needs about uh, four physical machines. Gives you three compute nodes and, and a control node. And you can try this stuff out for yourself. OK. so. That's LexD and Nova LexD. That's the positioning piece. That's, that's how it all plugs together. That's, that's the vision. Let's look at the reality of, of, of what a workload looks like from a performance perspective on, or between LexD and KVM. OK, so let's just talk about the reference platform a bit. Um, it's OpenStack Liberty on Ubuntu 15.10. It's Ubuntu 15.10, not Ubuntu 14.04, because that's our primary development focus for LexD right now. Um, LexD is coming to 14.04. That, that's work in progress and should be completed in the next couple of weeks, at which point you'll also be able to consume it on our, our current LTS release as well. There are four unit clouds, one control node, three compute nodes, 24 cores, 48 gig of RAM, and KVM or LexD for a hypervisor. But these things, two clouds running at the same time, completely identical. So the first benchmark we looked at was um, a Hadoop TerraSort benchmark. So TerraSort um, is a, a pretty industry standard benchmark for, for big data workloads. It, it generates a, um, a, a number of rows of random data and then sorts those um, in, into order. And, and it's, it's a fairly standard measure for evaluating uh, big data processing performance. So um, we looked at that in, in three contexts to evaluate how um, the, the workload would perform, both when there was nothing else running on the cloud and when there was contention happening on the cloud. And when there's nothing else happening on the cloud, the performance between KVM and LexD is very comparable. You know, the, the bars are, are not particularly different. But what's interesting is when you start to get more workload happening on the same underlying physical hardware that, and you get contention between those things, how LexD performs compared to KVM. So you can see from uh, the graph I've got up that when we, when we added more underlying units onto the cloud and, and added extra work going on in the background alongside the TerraSort, that we had a pretty consistent performance story from LexD. Um, it pretty much took the same time, however much extra load we pushed onto the cloud. Um, but with KVM, we did see some degradation. So, the reason for that is that, that all, all of the processes when you're running under LexD are running on a single kernel, single scheduler, same file system cache. It's getting all the, all the optimization that we can deliver by not having multiple kernels, full virtual machines running. Under KVM, you obviously do all have, have all of that overhead. And the, the cost of switching in and out KVM machines on and off processor is relatively expensive. So when you get a lot of that going on at any given point in time, you do see this type of performance degradation. So um, it's a great story for, for LexD in terms of how it manages that contention. And I think, I think that emphasizes if you've got a busy cloud with lots of busy workloads, then LexD is a, is a way to squeeze more out of the same physical resources without seeing the same levels of contention. The second benchmark we looked at for, for this talk is, was um, a Cassandra benchmark. So there's a tool called Cassandra Stress that allows you to exercise a Cassandra cluster um, in various different ways. And we, we looked at um, uh, write performance specifically. Um, the, the configuration we used was 200 threads running at any given point in time, performing about 10,000 operations on, on, on a three-unit cluster, so just a single unit on each of the underlying uh, hypervisors. Um, 
And that produced some interesting results. And I didn't believe it to start off with, so I tore all the clouds down, redeployed them, revalidated everything was set up, and ran them again. And this is where we do see a, bi a, a big performance difference between LexD and KVM. So this first graph is about the latency of every ride operation. So the average, average latency um, under LexD was about 30, 30 milliseconds per write. And under KVM, it was about 100, 105 milliseconds per write. Um, this workload is lots and lots of small I.O. from multiple different sources all at the same time. And we do see under LexD much, much better performance when you have this a high number of context switches happening on the network and disk all the time. Um, we see this type of, of latency difference. And that does translate into a, a very big difference in throughput. So maybe 3,000 rows a second under KVM, um, and almost 16,500 rows under LexD. So there's a great story there for, for, for workloads that are doing lots and lots of small I.O., and uh, I.O., whether it be disk, disk or networks, with lots and lots of riders. There's, there's a real big difference there. So it gives you a bit of, a bit of a, an idea about how, how LexD stacks up from a performance perspective. Um, so what's, what's up next? Um, as Mark, Mark detailed before, we've, we've, we're working towards um, Ubuntu 1604, which is our, our next long-term support release. Uh, the plan is that um, LexD and Nova LexD, our, our driver for OpenStack, will be um, production grade by the, in six months' time. Um, they're consumable now, um, recommended for testing and, and evaluation. We want, want people to start consuming them now and give us some feedback on them. Um, but we, we've got a few things to finish off. So. Um, Although we can do resource management right now, it's a little bit crude, and we want to improve that and make, make that a much richer experience so that we can expose more of the, the resource control semantics of OpenStack down into, into LexD containers. So that includes um, improved CPU control um, and, and storage control and network quas control as well. Um, we've got some additional options coming along uh, for underlying storage of containers. Right now, we support LVM and ButterFS as backends for the container root file systems, and that allows us to use the f features of those storage technologies to do things like fast cloning of machines and stuff like that. Um, you may see some announcements that Z um, Ubuntu 16.04 will include ZFS, um, so we will be adopting and testing with that as well. Um, and there's a few more pieces to do around live migration, um, which Tycho can talk to in a little bit of detail. Um, to, to allow that to work fully and securely across the board. OK, so um, that's our presentation. Um, I, we've left a, a good amount of time for questions. Uh, we thought there would probably be a few. So um, if anybody has any questions, please fire away. Yes. Uh, what tools do we use for benchmarking? What tools do we use for benchmarking? Um, so, the, the way we deploy the, the workloads is with Juju, and uh, Juju exposes um, a, a feature in Charms called Actions, which allow us to run um, uh, operational maintenance commands, but also to do things like benchmarking. So, for example, the big data bundle um, includes actions to run TerraSort. Um, so we, it, it's relatively easy to, to, to execute the, the benchmark and then grab the metrics back, and uh, Marco, Kepi, who's uh, one of my teammates, is going to be talking about our um, benchmarking story and how we're using that both across private and public clouds. Um, at 11.50. At 11.50 today. So we, we've got a story on, on, on how we do now, and we have a framework for pulling all that data together. And that's broadly how we've done this, this benchmarking as well. Other questions? Yes. Sorry. Uh, no, those guys are still hard at work. Um, uh, this is, uh, I think, a, just a different take on on how to do uh, machine containers and and that sort of thing. So the, the really the idea, as I mentioned earlier, is is the the, the core of LexD is the, this is a particular implementation using uh, LXC and Linux containers. But the the core is really the API. The the experience you have while using that. That's, that's what we want you to, to, to take away from this. So in principle, it would be possible to implement a, a LexD backend using OpenVEZ containers. Um, so yes? Yes, uh, so uh, LexD is um, 
uh, it's developed upstream, so github.com slash lxc, LX, uh, lexd. Uh, the way to think of it is Lex, lxc is really basically a C API with a few um, uh, command line tools that call into that C API, but they expose a fairly low level um, view on that. And so what LexD does is it, it adds a, a daemon, so it's written in Go, but it uses the Go LXC binding to just call that C API. So LXC, the LXC that is, you're, you've been using for years is still the thing that's actually doing the container management and you know, managing the C groups and setting up all the you know, bind mounts and whatever, the Vs and everything. Um, and, and, and LexD is really just basically a, a thin layer on top that that's, uh, exports a nice API to, that calls down into that particular binding. There's also a reason to have a daemon to do things like live migration and a few other b bells and whistles that you can add. There's, a, there's commands in LXC. There's the LXC checkpoint command. So you can, you can, you can kind of fake it, um, but LexD is really the, um, to, gives you a nice uh, view on that. Yes? Other question. Yep. How is the resource management, especially around CPU working? So is it the LXD with C groups type of thing? Yes, exactly. So the, the story, the LexD resource management story will be much improved come 1604. Right now we have very basic controls for uh, CPUs. Um, I'm, I actually don't think you can do pinning today. We have basic controls for memory, but it's all implemented under the hood through C groups. Um, but the idea is actually here that the, 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 the way that it's expressed in LexD is platform independent. So if, if something else comes along, for example, if you were to, to do an OpenVZ implementation and they have their user bean counters as the underlying implementation, you could take what, what the language that LexD uses and describe it in that format. So yes, the, the way we implement it today is uh, with C groups. And like I say, there, there's a, a specification, I think, We've done an internal review and it's and it's a go, so I think we'll be posting that shortly. Um, but there's there's also a mailing list discussion thread um, that we had about four months ago, just asking for user feedback about what sort of limiting you would like to do. So if you're interested in that at all, um, we'd be we'd love to hear from you. So yes. So we use uh, root volume on Ceph. Uh -huh. Ceph clusters. Is it possible to kind of compose that in a technology with LXD? Yes. So, so you're you're asking, um, can we can we expose the block device to a container? Is that is that your question? So uh, this is tricky. Um, there's a problem. The kernel. So the way the kernel does a mount is it reads the first you know few uh, you know however long on the on the block device and then tries to parse the super block and stuff like that. The super block parsers in the kernel have not before been considered safe to, uh, you know, arbitrary input. And so there's an issue where if, if, if you write some garbage to a, a super block and then the kernel tries to parse it and there's an exploit, bam, you have uh, kernel root. So it's, it's kind of tricky. Um, we have uh, a guy, so uh, the good news is that Ted So, who is the maintainer for the X4 file system, has said he would consider any bug um, that you know was uh, some security exploit like this th to be an actual bug in the, in the parser and he would fix it, um, which is great. Not all file system maintainers in the kernel have said that. There's also a patch set by a guy on our kernel team to enable um, mounting of X4 file systems from within user namespaces. So th this is ongoing work, um, but the, the, the story is still progressing. It's, um, so uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, okay great. Just to take a slightly different take on that, um, in the same way as we have local LVM and ButterFS storage options for container root file systems now, we have talked about the concept of using Ceph block devices, remote Ceph to block devices, and the features of thin copy on write clones to provide that. That's thought and conversation right now rather than reality, but it's, yeah, it's possible. But not, not arbitrary mounting of a block device into a container. That's the, the piece that Tycho is talking about. But we could, through LexD, have a storage backend that was Ceph based to provide those root file systems. Yeah. And I guess one final note is that we've also talked about having some API where users could potentially ask LexD to say, hey, I, tr I, I 
trust this block device, can you mount it into this container at this location? Um, so we have a feature where you can pass mounts into a container. Um, so it'd be something like that. Um, this is all, you know, we talked, the, the real thing I think is to fix the super block parsers in the kernel, but that is like a, um, a, a process, so. Yes? Yes, yes, so, so I hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I intend to have a conversation with Sage this week about. Yeah, yeah and so, and and exposure of of storage via something like Manila, um, via the the yep. mechanism that Tyco just talked about. So being able to present a file system and then have LexD present that to the container rather than it yeah. being presented directly in the container is is something that we we are looking at. Unfortunately, the Nova API doesn't have semantics for that yet, but that's, that's a different challenge. <laughs> Other questions? Anyone? Going once? Twice? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>